Uh, I'd like to start by introducing Chaplain John Reed, who will offer an invocation. Chaplain Reed, would you please come forward? Let us pray. Holy God, to care for others, to really care for others with compassion and genuine caring will always just simply be exhausting work. Yet each one here has chosen to care in spite of that. Help each of us to be open to being cared for and empower us to absolutely care for each other. That at the end of the day, we might be able to provide the absolute best caring that we are capable of for those who so richly deserve it from us. For this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You all know how much of your time is spent taking care of everyone and everything, often leaving little or even no time for yourselves. We become so immersed in helping our families and friends that our own needs seem to meld into the background until suddenly something happens, some little thing often that really doesn't have any great importance to us, but it's enough to make us feel overwhelmed and we snap. Today's theme is about addressing those, <clears throat> excuse me, those everyday life events that we often allow to build until we just feel like we can't deal with it any longer. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Colonel Wendy Martinson. Thank you, Ms. Sylvia, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you all back again. I'm glad that you made it through the rain and all the, the wind and everything. Well, on Monday, our senior leadership provided us with key areas of emphasis on support of soldier and family programs and services. During day two, we looked at the effects of deployments on our children and adolescents and the many DOD and Army programs and services that support children and adolescents during caregiver deployments. Today's forum will focus on the individual, us. What we need to do to help us here at home on the home front as our spouses and loved ones are deployed. To open today's forum, a man I've known for 25 years, he works tirelessly to support soldiers and all of you, our family members. I trust him, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you this morning the Surgeon General of the United States Army and the Commander of the United States Army Medical Command, Lieutenant General Eric Schoomaker. Well, good morning, and thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Colonel Martinson. Uh, uh, Colonel Wendy Martinson is, uh, is the uh, MedCom and uh, Office of Surgeon General's Director of Strategic Communications and experienced Medical Service Corps officer herself, uh, a personnelist by training, a former garrison commander of the Fort Sam Houston garrison, and uh, we're, we're privileged to have uh, Wendy, who's approaching the end of a very long and distinguished career, um, here uh, uh, by my side. and. Um, soon to join the ranks of the veterans of, of uh, Army Medicine. Thanks, Wendy, for your own service. Uh, I hope to spend a few minutes today talking to you about uh, programs in health and health care delivery. And I, and I separate those somewhat from one another. Uh, I, as I said yesterday to, uh, to the uh, speak a little louder. I've got this great microphone here. Is it not on? Mic check. Mic check. You all hear me in the back? Well, I'm having no trouble hearing myself up here, I'll tell you that. Uh, maybe the, you can hear me, yeah. General, General Tucker up here can hear me. Um, we have a solution for this. Do you have a, do you have a lavalier mic? Yes, sir. Someone's going back to check the sound in the back room. Okay. Okay. Well, while, I'm, uh, while we're seeing, I'll just yell a little bit. Is this? Is this any better in the back? Okay. A little hard on the front, but <laughs> and, uh, certainly violating my uh, hearing uh, conservation program. <laughs> but General Tucker's an old tanker. He can't hear a thing anyway. <laughs> Am I right? Hey, well, uh, I can't see very well because we've got these big lights facing me, but how many people in the audience are our family members uh, come from across, oh great, terrific, about, about half of the room. H how many of you are providers 
of health or health care or are promoters of health and health care. That is people in the front, a smaller group. And the rest are lost. <laughs> okay, this is the family forum, and we're going to talk a little bit about the medical command. Are we, are we coming across any better in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. We're going to talk a little bit today about um, health and health care delivery. And, and as I started off by saying, one of the very proud features of, of, of my service and one of the reasons I've remained on active duty as long as I have in, in uniform is that we are a system that is as much for health as we are as a health care system. That is to say we in, in Army medicine and in military medicine as a whole focus as much on the sustainment of health and the promotion and the maintenance of good health and well-being in, in a holistic sense as we do toward the provision of health care should you fall off this balance beam of good health. And, and what I like to point out to everyone is that if, if nothing else, war, especially war which has gone on as long as this war has, uh, demonstrates that bad things are going to happen to good people all the time in spite of every effort. We can design the best body armor, the best combat you know, goggles and, and, and Wiley D's and, and Kevlar and, and vehicles and aircraft. We can do everything we can to keep the soldier, the sailor, the airman, marine, coast guardsman, the warrior out of harm's way. But in spite of our best efforts, we still have grievous wounds of war. And even when we don't have direct wounds delivered by the enemy with a weapon, we have the psychological impact of war. Uh, some of the protections that we've now afforded to our soldiers in combat have paradoxically delivered a different kind of casualty to us. It's delivered a survivor of a battle that in past wars would not have survived. And, and a whole new set of problems for those. We have over 1,200 amputees, some, many of them 20% or so, and I'm pulling this out of my head and be, should be careful, have multiple amputations. And we've been remarkably good at retaining those, those uh, soldiers in uniform. Roughly 200 have remained in uniform. 40 have redeployed to combat. My, my former aide, whom, whose picture is often featured here, and, and many of you know Dave Rizal, is on his third deployment to Iraq, due to come home in five weeks, his second as an amputee. Four of our amputees actually have gone back into combat not having lost their limbs in combat. They lost them in training accidents, motor vehicle accidents, other causes. So it's a remarkable accomplishment for the soldier and the family who supports that soldier. It's a, it's a tribute to the system of care in totality that we've been able to keep soldiers who would otherwise ha have died in, in previous uh, conflicts, but it has delivered to us uh, some real daunting challenges. And we also know that the succession of, of blasts that soldiers are exposed to in combat are also leading to what we call mild traumatic brain injury or concussions as they're known more frequently across the world and the country that uh, are associated with, we believe, and the science is beginning to give us more facts about this, associated with a higher rate of post-traumatic stress reactions, that is, a normal human reaction to a, to a life-threatening stress experience, and post-traumatic stress disorder, that is, the persistence of symptoms associated with post-traumatic stress, fight-or-flight symptoms that would normally be adaptive to us in a life-threatening circumstance, like a motor vehicle accident or, or a, a criminal who's approaching us, or combat, but when it's persistent, begins to interfere with our lives and begins to disrupt our relationships and leads us to do things like seek over-the-counter drugs, the most common over-the-counter drug in America being alcohol. So we have a, a new set of challenges. I was, I was gratified to hear the chief talk at lunch yesterday, and he's talked in multiple fora, that as the demand on the force goes down, and we begin to have more time with our soldiers back home. For the first time in nine years, as I understand it, Sergeant Major, uh, uh, we have the entire contingent of soldiers 
at Fort Lewis, Washington, back at Fort Lewis, Washington, for the first time in nine years. Unbelievable. And that's going to give families time to, to rest. It's going to give time for soldiers whom we know require a minimum of 24 to 30 months to recover. We now have done studies downrange and soldiers in follow-up to know that we require a dwell time of 24 to 30 months to get restoration of the baseline psychology of that soldier. But, but that's also going to lead to demands on us to follow that soldier and family to assist them long term. So we're in this for the long run. And the, the Army is going to have some breathing room here, thank God. The, the Army is going to have a chance to turn to garrison-based work, and we're starting to, re, to do training again uh, the way we used to do uh, with, with combat-focused soldiers now. We're actually practicing the expert field medical badge. We haven't practiced the expert field medical badge in many, many years. Why? Because every year we had a real world event downrange uh, where you didn't have to practice it, it was the real thing. So these are all good news stories, but we should rem be reminded that we have many years now of follow-up for care, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So my theme today, and you'll hear this, uh, and, and Wendy, correct me, but uh, we should have a video here at the very end of this just to reinforce one of the themes that we're bringing in here of our efforts on the part of, of Army Medicine to to, to inspire and to maintain trust with you and to develop a mutual d dialogue with you around th this trust. You see the soldiers and the families uh, here getting ready to go in some cases, uh, being back in garrison uh, for, the, for the family and being reunited and restored and, and reintegrated into the force and, and the challenges. Let's go to the first slide. Now, everybody in the front row and sprinkled around that I recognize as part of my team would be disappointed if I didn't talk a minute about our balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard is, the, is Army Medicine's uh, campaign plan. It's, the, it's our mission essential task list and our enabling tasks. We have a very broad requirement from, all the way from protecting the health of warriors, protecting the health of families and so, uh, families uh, of those warriors and retirees, we have, a, we, we, have a, we have a goal of, of, of restoring people to good health should they become ill or injured or combat wounded. We have a requirement and a goal to deploy successfully as a medical force because at any one time, 10% of the docs and nurses who are deployed downrange actually come directly out of hospitals and clinics and veterinary units and laboratories that are sprinkled around my command. And then we have a, a, a very important goal to maintain your satisfaction with our care and, and, and to serve stakeholders like the commanding general of the 2nd Infantry Division here in the second row who started up our warrior transition program, uh, General Tucker, and to maintain your trust. And we do that all through a, uh, those are our mission essential tasks and we do that through a series of enabling tasks, processes internal that, that start with our resources, our people, money that we put, pump into the system and re readjust accordingly. We call it a balanced scorecard because it's a little bit like my 12-year-old balancing on his skateboard left and right across these competing missions, even as he's balancing front and back to make sure that what we're doing in the near term is going to accentuate what's going to happen in the in long term. We feel very strongly about this. In fact, we feel so strongly that, that we actually print the scorecard on our... On our <laughs> And with a new Army uh, uh, service uniform, I've, I've got, uh, for those in the audience, I've got even the uh, formal version of this thing. <laughs> so you can't go to bed in, in Army medicine that you aren't thinking uh, deeply about how we satisfy this very, very broad competing mission. Part of that mission is right here, uh, incorporated in a covenant that, that is our, ask, that's our piece of the Army family covenant and the community covenant, covenant that pledges that we are going to do all in our power, as you can see there, to, to optimize health, to provide the very best evidence-based practices, meaning that what we 
provide for you in our clinics, in our hospitals, in our medical centers, in evacuation back from the front, in rehabilitation programs, in our warrior transition units, wherever it may get, as often as possible, in our dental clinics, because I see my dental commander here from uh, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Pris Priscilla Hamilton, that, we, that the services we deliver have the best evidence behind them as possible. It's not always possible to get practices to people and treatments to people that are um, entirely reliant upon good science. But whenever possible, we are pledged to give the highest quality evidence-based practices. Uh, not unlike how I was trained as a, as a hematologist that when I treated someone with cancer, that cancer treatment had been vetted against careful studies uh, and clinical trials that documented that if I gave you a very uh, dangerous drug that more likely than, than not you were going to get better because of it. In fact, the highest probability that you're going to get better. We're committed to all of what you see here uh, on this, on this uh, uh, screen to include access and continuity. And was I, I stress that most of us, and I, and I am, as I said yesterday in the, in the, in the, uh, the Institute of Land Warfare panel, uh, one of the nice things about being in Army Medicine as well is that I'm not only the president of the Hair Club for Men, but I'm a user. <laughs> you know, I'm a patient in this system. Uh, so when I train a doc out there, or when I see a medic being trained, or one of our respiratory technicians, or, or an administrator, I know this is important to me. This is deeply personal to me. I have a father and a mother who are in this system. I have, I have an br older brother who is still a part of this system, a niece and a nephew, and even one in the Air Force. Uh, I, long story, I won't get into that, but <laughs> uh, one of the wayward children who is flying 130s right now. Uh, this is a deeply personal thing to us. Uh, and, and I will tell you, as a patient in our own system, I will trade continuity with a clinician who understands who I am for immediate access any day. And that's something that we are trying increasingly to provide for our, for our families. Now, this is the health care covenant that my Sergeant Major and I, Althea Dixon, and my Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major, if you wouldn't mind standing up, this is a Command Sergeant Major Althea Dixon, my, my battle buddy. <laughs> Great, great soldier, medic who has, who has kept me out of trouble and guided me for, for many years. We are pledged to delivering this on behalf of the command. Next slide, please. We are committed to delivering optimized physical and psychological health promotion. I want to keep you healthy first and foremost. Uh, you heard in the introduction about what happens when you get to the breaking point. Our goal is to keep you away from the breaking point. Optimally, that's what we want. And so what we want to do is be tied as much as we can to the Army's Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Program. We want to be tied as much as we can to the, to the chaplain's programs in Strong Bonds. We want a coherent plan that, that allows um, all of us to uh, optimize uh, on a daily basis uh, our individual and personal and family perf performance and to, to muster the strength necessary that keeps us away from that, that point of, of, of breaking. But we recognize that, that, that th this, in some families, and for some soldiers, and for, for some of our family members, uh, some of our retired folks too, I mean, we're, none of us is exempt from serious challenges in life. We want to do this in a comprehensive way that ties together all the tools. And so uh, we have, we're currently rolling out and are about over a year into a comprehensive plan that is harvesting best practices, meaning those programs that work the very best across our behavioral health programs, both in the pre-deployment, in, de in the deployed, and in the, in the post-deployment reset phase, all of the behavioral health assets uh, and what we know about individual soldiers and families together into one comprehensive uh, uh, program we call the Pro Comprehensive Behavioral Health System of Care. We want to be able to find and track that soldier who may have suffered a concussion downrange, who, who now under our protocols in place today in Afghanistan and Iraq will be identified as close to the concussion as possible, just as we would with a bike accident or a soccer field accident uh, or, you know, or fall off a ladder here in the United States. 
will be given a, a, a knee for 24 hours, observed by a medic for symptoms or signs, watched by their fellow soldiers and their commanders for any sign that they're not thinking right, and then formally evaluated and, if necessary, put to rest uh, for the time necessary to recover from that concussion. Because we know that the vast majority of concussions, mild traumatic injuries, will spontaneously improve with just time alone, 95 percent plus. But if re-injured during a critical healing phase, they, they, you, we all run the risk of having an enduring injury that you may not successfully recover from. We also know that that, that concussive injury obtained probably in a combat situation or a life-threatening circumstance is different than a football player on the Pittsburgh Steelers waking up in a, in a football stadium with a crowd roaring and a trainer at their side and a coach worried about you know, his $20 million investment. Uh, in combat, that's associated with the, the, the continued horror of war, friends who may have been killed or injured, uh, people possibly in, still firing at you, civilian carnage. And, and, and is associated, we believe, with a higher rate of, of post-traumatic stress reactions and post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe in part because the brain has been jangled there, for lack of a better way of describing it, not being a neuroscientist myself. So these are all programs aimed at maximizing this physical and psychological health. Uh, next slide, please. This is this comprehensive behavioral health system of care I described. And it's a little complicated here, but, but, but what this is right here is the Army's force generation model, the three-phase cyclic reiterative process of preparing soldiers and units to deploy, manning, training, and equipping, of deploying them. We call it available, for, but for nine years, if you were available, you were deployed. And, and fortunately, we're going to enter into a phase where availability will not necessarily be deployment. It may be tagged against a contingency operation and, and remain in, in garrison or somewhere within the continental United States or in a humanitarian mission. And then the reset phase here where you, we reintegrate and reset and restore the soldier and the family and, and reunite them with the community. And, and we, as, we, as the chief reminds us, this, these two phases, the dwell phase of a soldier over the last nine years has rarely exceeded 1.3 relative to one year deployment. So we've been running a one to one, one to in some cases less than one. There are units out there that we know and you know have deployed short of a year of dwell. We want to see this uh, meet and exceed a two year dwell, um, ideally a three year dwell, and for the reserves uh, a three to five year dwell. What we're doing is tying together through a series of what's shown on the slide is touch points. Uh, uh, let me emphasize, and the reason we got pictures of people in the middle here is that inside this Army force generation model of tra manning, training, equipping, deploying, fighting, uh, defending, re re recovering, uh, and, and resetting the, the unit and the soldiers are human beings, are soldiers and families. And that human dimension inside that Army Force Generation model is often uh, disrespectful of where you are on the cycle of Arphigen. When a child gets gravely ill, it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't care what the Arphigen cycle is, whether you're in trained and ready or reset. When, when, a fam, when, a, when a husband or a wife or a girlfriend, boyfriend is, is strained beyond the limits of that marriage, is independent often of where you are in that cycle. And what the soldier is experiencing, I remember talking to the brigade commander of the 173rd in Afghanistan about two years ago, talking about in his fourth deployment inside of five or six years, his, his surprise that early in the deployment, 30, 60, 90 days into the deployment, his biggest problems with behavioral health challenges to the force in his brigade were actually experienced NCOs and, and officers who were back for their second or third or fourth deployments and were re-experiencing memories of the last deployment and led them to problems that they weren't ready for because that human dimension is, doesn't necessarily follow what we think. So what we've tried to do here is tie together all of the elements to include uh, the annual health assessments that we conduct, 
the pre-deployment assessments in the train and ready phase, what happens to the soldier when they're in deployment, such as exposure to a, a blast injury and treatment for that injury downrange, or seeking care in a, in a, in a stress control unit, uh, what we know about the family's stresses back home. Uh, if you've got problems of a family uh, with family discord and possibly alcohol before you go, that's something we ought to know and tie to what you, we do to you when you return. Blinding flash to the obvious. Best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. That's what our psychologists and psychiatrists teach us. And so we want to tie these points together. And when you get back, when that soldier, that warrior gets back, we want to, we want to have a face-to-face -face encounter with a primary care provider who's been trained in, some, in behavioral health training that we've worked with the VA to develop to give specific training around this. We want to we wanna provide the surveys uh, about information that occurred to the soldier uh, in terms of, of their symptoms. Uh, you know, are you sleeping well? Uh, are, you, are you demonstrating irritability? Are you having intrusive thoughts? Uh, are you concerned about your, your health and well-being? We want to tie that then in, into this reintegration step uh, that all soldiers go through. And if necessary, we want to provide them counseling on the spot or after block leave, because frankly what we discover is, is that the excitement about getting home and the eagerness to get into block leave frequently obscures or reduces a lot of those symptoms or leads soldiers not to be entirely honest about, about, about what, what's really bothering them. But three, four weeks later after the, after the, uh, the, the parade and the ceremony has passed is when they start to surface. And at that point, we want to be able to refer soldiers either to face-to-face -face counseling or what we're discovering is the willingness of soldiers, sometimes even preference of soldiers, to use what we call virtual behavioral health, to talk to a counselor through, through, a, through a camera, something that I'm a little uncomfortable with. But our younger soldiers and this, this digital generation, like my teenagers, who sit there with their then text messages to one another who are five feet away, you know, I don't... I don't like your hair today. Well, why don't you just say that to her? No, no, no. I, I got to work behind this little phone here. You know, Dad. The, the, you know, this this spinach is really awful. You know, Evan, you're right there. Just tell me. You know, this generation is far more comfortable talking through the screen, and and in some cases, and so we've devised. A, a system that allows us to reach out to counselors, psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists who might be quite removed. They may be in Triple Army Medical Center in Hawaii with, with, with General Gallagher's folks here in the, in, the, in the third row, but they may be at Fort Stewart, Georgia, where they're getting the reintegration. So that's our comprehensive behavioral health system of care and wrapping all of the cycle together and the family and the soldier together. I want you to be aware of that know that we're working very actively to standardize that and to roll that out across the Army using the, the, patch, the patch chart of deploying and redeploying units. We've now had about 50,000 soldiers come back through Hawaii, Fort Richardson, Joint Base lewis McCord, uh, uh, Fort uh, uh, Lewis, uh, Fort Carson, uh, Fort Bliss, uh, and we're rolling this out uh, as, as those units return. Uh, Fort Stewart is our focus right now because we have a very large contingent coming into Fort Lewis and then and, and, and to Fort Cars, or Campbell. Next slide, please. We, I talked a little bit about this, but I can't emphasize this enough. The, 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 our reliance upon and our insistence upon, and you should insist upon as consumers, one of the reasons that many of us also are pleased and privileged to be in this uniform is Frankly, our patients are some of the best patients we will ever be privileged to treat. Not only because of the service that you, that you uh, have provided for the nation and my family, but because of who you are. You're a very well-informed, very critical group of healthcare consumers. Very different than many of the patients that I treated when I was in my own uh, training outside of the military who couldn't afford their medications, many of whom couldn't read, and where a visit would be spent as much time just explaining what a medicine was based upon its shape and its color. 
Uh, most of our patients come to the clinic armed for bear. You know, with the latest download from from the women's magazines or or Men's Health and and what's come across on AOL that day or or CNN and and it's challenging to the average provider. And I don't know if you got the same experience, Chaplain, in your world, but it certainly is a part of our world. You should be insisting on the same level of high quality, scientifically driven care. And Increasingly, we recognize the need to deliver that through interdisciplinary teams. Probably a good example of that in the partnership that's required to make all of this work. Because quite frankly, the, the Installation Management Command, the chaplains, the G1 community, the Army Corps of Engineers, we're all in a partnership with the Army Commands, Forcecom and, and AMC and TRADOC, to ensure that that these services are delivered across the Army in a uniform fashion and with as, uh, and as comprehensively as and integrated the service as possible. Installation Management Command now owns the Army Substance Abuse Program. And we are there to support them professionally and to provide the, the oversight of, of how that clinician is working, but for education and training and for screening, that's, that's all in the hands of the MCON, so we gotta work together on that. Our warrior transition units, all 29 of them across units in the Army today, are reliant upon Installation Management Command, the Army Corps of Engineers, to provide us the best barracks possible. And that's going extremely well. So this is a partnership of interdisciplinary teams. Next slide, please. One of the really exciting things that we're doing, not only in the Army, but we're doing across the military health system, is what's called the patient-centered medical home. Patient-centered medical home is a, a, a means, a method by which primary care-centered services are, are, are delivered to, to our patients. And it involves the enrollment of a patient, uh, in a, a beneficiary, because quite frankly, and this is where we have to use words like beneficiary, our goal is to keep people from becoming patients. What we want is people to be kept healthy. And one of the ways we can do that is to get you enrolled in a primary care clinic with a team of physician, PA, nurse practitioner, a nurse case manager, of technicians enlisted or civilian who can provide comprehensive primary care based services with continuity, especially around people who have chronic disease processes like diabetes and asthma and heart disease, chronic low back pain best delivered in this kind of a setting and not in an emergency room or an urgent care clinic where episodic care is, doesn't give us the best outcomes. And when we do this and do it successfully, what we find is ER visits begin to drop, urgent care clinics begin to drop, and our part of this is to expand the access to, to clinics like this and the continuity of care. In fact, for over two years now, I've been tracking across the Army Patient by patient, and I, my commanders know this because they have a little post-traumatic stress about how many times I've been in their face about it, how many times a patient gets back to his or her primary care manager. And if not to the primary care manager, how many times they get back to the team of three to five physicians or nurse practitioners that make up that primary care team. And some places are doing this extraordinarily well. Carlo Barracks, Pennsylvania. Uh, small military and civilian clinic at the Army War College. And that's a transient population of over 300 students that come and go every year. And yet, we have over 75% continuity of care within a team in that place. And very high patient satisfaction. And that's the other part. Patient satisfaction in these settings is, is, goes sky high. In fact, attention to access to care, attention to good health, as one of the focuses of this, attention to continuity of care, and attention to, for lack of a better term, customer service. Behaviors that foster your trust in us have resulted in now overall satisfaction in Army medical clinics across the